I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Alan Smits. I'm the Associate Dean for Sciences in the College of Arts and Sciences. And I'd like to welcome you to this uh, double header event. Uh, that double header is uh, co sponsored, really, by uh, the Quinnipiac University uh, Interdisciplinary Program for uh, Research and Scholarship, uh, as well as the Bristol Myers Squibb Center uh, for uh, Science Le Teaching and Learning. So we're Glad to have this event, and the very first event for which all of you are first gathered uh, is this uh, lecture, which we uh, identify and call the interdisciplinary lecture, which is associated directly with the Quinnipiac University uh, program for research and scholarship, which uh, I will from now on just call it the Quip RS program. It is a mouthful. We have. Um, this sort of dual function uh, every year, really to celebrate uh, the hard work that our QUIP RS students have uh, dedicated their, their summers to. It's an eight week uh, summer research program in which our students work directly with a faculty mentor. Um, it's a stipend program in which uh, they get to learn uh, shoulder to shoulder with their faculty mentor. So I'd really like to just take briefly, because there's so many students here um, today, to briefly describe what QUIP is, uh, what its value is, why it's so important, and how you can become a QUIP RS student that we commonly call a QUIPPER. <laughs> As I said, um, it's an eight-week program where you work with your uh, faculty mentor to answer some sort of research question, and it can be in any discipline. This is a cross-university interdisciplinary program. So we have historians, we have English uh, majors, we have business majors, uh, science majors, students all across the university that are part of this eight-week summer experience. We support you with a $4,000 stipend so that you don't have to work or take classes during that time, and you can devote 35 or 40 hours a week just to doing your research protocol. Why is it so important? We think that the QUIP RS program is one of the highest forms of learning. And why? It's because you learn by doing. You don't learn in a lecture situation. You learn by doing, making discoveries, making mistakes, uh, going through the frustration and elation of finding things out. It heightens critical thinking. It builds confidence. It reinforces deductive and inductive reasoning, it strengthens your oral and written communication skills, and it develops an appreciation for how students in different majors perceive the world through the research that they're doing. How can you become a quipper? Very soon, pretty soon in, uh, in February or March, you will see an announcement in your email as well as on my queue the invitation to apply. We only accept about 10 to 15 of these students per year, so it can be very competitive. But begin to talk to your faculty mentor, the one that strikes your fancy and you'd like to answer a research question with, and put together a proposal. Um, that's all that's required. And those announcements about who is selected for the QUIP RS program are made in April. And then in uh, June, we go to work. We look forward to your applications. We look forward in, to your participation in this forum today. So please, after today's lecture, linger outside to where our students from last year's, last summer's poster sessions are displaying and would like to talk to you about their work. Introducing today's speaker will be Dr. Mark Thompson, who is our Senior Vice President for Academic and Student Affairs. Um, Dr. Thompson uh, is not only a strong supporter of the QUIP RS program, but he's also a strong financial supporter. And without him and his office, uh, the QUIP RS program 
would not run. So I'd like to not only thank Mark, but ask him now to come up and introduce our speaker. Thank you, Alan, and welcome everyone to this afternoon's event. I'm pleased to see so many of you here, and I'm particularly excited to see the work of our students. Congratulations on the great uh, research work that you've done. I'm very pleased by what I've seen uh, briefly, and I'm happy to spend some more time uh, to take a look at things in more detail uh, following the session uh, this afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to introduce my counterpart from Yale and our guest speaker today, Peter Salovey, who is the provost and Chris Argus, uh, professor of psychology at Yale University. He joined the Yale faculty in 1986 after receiving an AB and an MA from Stanford University in 1980 with departmental honors and university distinction and a PhD from Yale in 1986. He holds secondary faculty appointments in the schools of management and public health and the Institution for Social and Policy Studies. He was appointed Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences in January 2003 and in 2004 he was appointed Dean of Yale College. On August 27, 2008, he was named provost of Yale University and took that job effective October 1st of 2008. Dr. Salovey has authored or edited 13 books, translated into 11 languages, and published more than 350 journal articles and essays focused primarily on human emotion and health behavior. With John D. Mayer, he developed a broad framework called emotional intelligence, the theory that just as people have a wide range of intellectual abilities, they also have a wide range of emotional skills that profoundly affect their thinking and action. In his research on health behavior, Dr. Salovey investigates the effectiveness of health promotion messages in persuading people to change, change risky behaviors relevant to cancer and HIV AIDS. Dr. Salovey served as president of the Society for General Psychology and treasurer of the International Society for Research on Emotion. He was the founding editor of the Review of General Psychology and an associate editor of Emotion and Psychological Bulletin. In addition to teaching and mentoring scores of graduate students, Dr. Salovey has won both the William Clyde Devane Medal for Distinguished Scholarship and Teaching in Yale College and the Lex Hickson 63 Prize for Teaching Excellence in the Social Sciences. And in 2009, he received an honorary doctorate from the University of Pretoria in South Africa. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Peter Salovey, and I uh, ask that you join in welcoming him. Thank you so much for that uh, kind and generous introduction. I wish my mother were here to have heard that. She would have enjoyed that even more than me, I think. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's nice to see a few familiar faces, and it's especially nice to be a part of uh, this interdisciplinary research program. Uh, I got a chance to glance at some of the posters on the way in and look forward to seeing them uh, after the talk in more detail and really to learn about how you can predict who's going to be the next uh, uh, most valuable player in the uh, National League, I guess it was, uh, uh, using regression model. I, that, was, uh, that was the one that caught my eye, uh, but I will take a look at all of them uh, after the talk. Um, I hope I'm actually uh, going to be able to demonstrate a little bit of uh, um, interdisciplinary research today. It's primarily psychological, but it borrows on biology, uh, it borrows on management and business, uh, has applications certainly in that direction, uh, has some statistics in it. Uh, I'm trying to think what else might be uh, in it. Certainly. Um, uh, uh, some of my work also has some public health implications, although that won't be so obvious today. I'm going to talk about emotional intelligence, and I'm going to ask the question, is there anything to it? And obviously, if I thought the answer to that question was no, it would be a very brief talk, and we'd all probably leave, look at the posters, and uh, uh, not, have to, um, not have to listen to what I have uh, to say today. But I'm going to argue yes, that there is something to it. Uh, that these are a set of skills that you can measure, that you can define, that you can measure, uh, and that predicts something important uh, in the world. And when I say in the world, I mean in social life, families, in the world of work, in schools, uh, and in other uh, uh, important contexts. Um, I'm going to try to convince you uh, not that it's more important than anything else or, or you know, some of the things you see in the media about emotional intelligence. I don't, I don't think there's a need for exaggerated claims. Uh, 
But I do think this is an area of human difference uh, that has been, uh, uh, in a way, uh, neglected uh, historically uh, and uh, uh, proves to be more important, perhaps, than people think uh, it is. All right, but let me step back from all of that and tell you where I got interested and how I got interested in emotional intelligence. It came from looking at public figures. Here's one in particular. This is back in the day when I used to have a big mustache. Uh, also, it was back in the day when um, Bill Clinton was president, or maybe shortly afterwards. And this is an interesting social interaction for a psychologist to study. What's happening in this picture? Well, he's giving a talk on the Yale campus, and many of us have been lined up in a room to meet him and welcome him to campus and get a chance to shake his hand and get our pictures taken uh, with, with President Clinton. Now, in this situation, what you first should notice is that I am kind of nervous. And you can tell that I'm nervous, especially by looking at my face. My mouth is smiling, but my eyes aren't. That's the quickest way to identify a fake smile, right? A real smile involves the eyes and the mouth. The eyes crinkle, the mouth smiles. But my eyes aren't crinkling at all because it's a fake smile. I'm nervous. I'm too nervous to smile. So it's looking something like this. <laughs> right? Fake smile. You can also tell that was a fake smile because it came on too quickly. Another clue. Anyway, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm faking my smile. Uh, and uh, Bill Clinton is doing something very interesting. First of all, what is he doing non-verbally? He's giving me a nice handshake being warm, he's smiling more genuinely at me, uh, 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 actually seems happy to be uh, on campus that day. But what is he saying in this picture? What he's saying to me is, uh, I was Dean at the time, he says, oh, Dean Salovey, we're old friends. And I'm thinking to myself, we're old friends? Uh, and what he's referring to, he says, we, we, we met earlier today. Well, in fact, we had. Uh, I was looking for a parking space on campus, and uh, I was late, and uh, I sort of, I, I don't know quite how to describe it, but essentially I cut off his limousine <laughs> <laughs> and grabbed the, grabbed the parking spot that I think his driver actually was aiming for. This caused the Secret Service, who, who are with him, to jump out of the car, and then, oh, I didn't know who was in the car, a window rolled down, and it was Bill Clinton. And he said, it's OK, guys. It's OK. That's the dean. So yes, we've met before. <laughs> Our meeting was this awkward interaction where we were fighting over a parking spot. Um, but he said, oh, we've met before. What he's trying to do, he's recognizing at some level that I'm anxious. And he's trying to make me feel more comfortable by saying, well, we're, we're, we know each other. We're old friends and uh, trying to get me to relax a bit. A bit. So he's using a variety of skills. Uh, he's recognizing my emotion, happy but anxious. He's empathizing with it. Remember, uh, those of you who are old enough, Bill Clinton, one of his favorite expressions was, I feel your pain. Right? He's empathic, and that's what he was doing. He's, he feels my anxiety. But he's going to give me a warm hand handshake and a big smile and look me in the eye and try to make me feel comfortable. He's got a lot of skills here. But there's another reason why I love to show this slide. Because it reminds me that emotional intelligence isn't just one thing. It's a set of skills. At least that's what I'm going to argue. And it's a set of skills on which people can have strengths and weaknesses. You all have a kind of profile. You're better at some of these skills than others. And there's an aspect of emotional intelligence that Bill Clinton actually was not very good at. And it has to do with regulating, managing his own emotions. So the people who worked with him in the White House used to say that he was short-tempered and that he would yell and, yell and scream and stomp his feet. And then, of course, his second uh, term was essentially, if not ruined, severely distracted by a scandal where he had sex with, a, with an intern in the White House. Again, a kind of failure 
of uh, self-regulation, failure to manage his own uh, emotions. Now, why does this slide remind me of all of this? Well, that's my wife, Marta, who sometimes teaches at Quinnipiac in the political science department, um, uh, uh, in the middle between Bill Clinton and myself. And when I blew this slide up the first time, I noticed where Bill Clinton's arm was <laughs> relative. <laughs> And it reminded me that he, he also has some deficits in emotional intelligence. Now, of course, <laughs> my wife, when we got home, all she could say was, man, he is the most charismatic person I have ever met. Why can't you be more like Bill Clinton? <laughs> Things of this nature. But now I know why, because he was flirting with her the whole time. OK. So, why are we hearing about an idea like emotional intelligence now? <clears throat> well, there is something historical, a historical trend in the field of psychology happening that allows this idea, I think, to become uh, of interest at this moment. Really two historical trends. The first one is the way in which our view of emotion is changing. So when I took introductory psychology, and certainly when my mother and father took introductory psychology, if they did, um, the view of emotion that was dominant in the textbooks was something like, we have emotions, but they're kind of left over from our being descended from animals. Just like your wisdom teeth or your appendix, these are kind of vestiges of times gone by when you had to, you know, um, fight to survive or to eat or to mate or what have you. And in fact, in, my, in, in contemporary life, for most humans, your emotions get in the way. That was the view. Similarly, there was a kind of old view of what, what it meant to be smart, what it meant to be intelligent. And the old view of what it meant to be intelligent was simply you did well on whatever it was that IQ tests measured, which turns out to be analytical abilities but not other things, not creativity, not practical intelligence, not music, musical talent, all kinds of things not measured by intelligence. And so those two views, that emotions are vestigial, right, not important, and that intelligence is just this narrow thing, gave way to other views. In the emotion area, gave way to uh, th th this view, this old view, that passion and reason are opposites, that emotions are immature, chaotic, gave way to a view that said emotions are functional. They help us figure out what to pay attention to. They help motivate our behavior. They help us get up and do what needs to be done. And they help especially us figure out what's not important and what is important. Okay? They organize us. That's the new view. That new view isn't so new. In, in a certain way, you can anticipate it by reading Darwin. One of Darwin's great books was called The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. There's all kinds of great pictures in that book of animals expressing emotion. Darwin never used the term emotional intelligence, but he, he would have said emotions are a smart system. They help energize what we need to do. It is easier to fight an enemy when you're angry. It is easier to uh, run away when you're afraid. It is easier to mate when you're in a good mood. It is easier to get help from, from others. You're an, you are an animal in this discussion. Uh, um, uh, when you're sad and withdrawn. Okay? So they energize required behavior. They also signal something. And Darwin talked a lot about the equivalent of facial expressions, but in animals. Right? So an animal growls, its, it bears its teeth and growls. It's saying something like, signaling something like, you're blocking my goal. It's making me angry. See these teeth? I'm going to bite you with them if you keep doing this. So back off. Okay. Obviously, this is facetious, but, but, but you get the idea. Darwin actually argued there's a purpose. There's a function for the emotions in helping us do what we need to do and helping signal valued information. All of this helping us survive. Similarly, uh, as I said, in the view of intelligence that it's just IQ is giving way to a view since about the mid-80s 
that intelligence is much broader than that. So my former colleague at Yale, Bob Sternberg, wrote a book arguing that, wrote several books, arguing that emotions are three different things, creativity, practical intelligence, like street smarts, as well as traditional IQ, analytic intelligence. And uh, not to be uh, outdone, Howard Garner up at Harvard argued at the time in 1983 that, that intelligence was seven things. I think it's now up to about 11. One of them including what he called intrapersonal intelligence, access to your feelings, the ability to discriminate feelings, the ability, the last part I think is most important, to use your feelings to understand and guide your behavior. Okay, that's very close to what we are talking about with emotional intelligence. So what you see is a change in the way emotions are thought of, a change in the way intelligence is thought of, and it creates just the right mix for arguing maybe there's something about emotions that can be thought of as a kind of intelligence. Maybe there's something to the idea of emotional intelligence. So in the late 1980s, Jack Mayer, who's a professor up at the University of New Hampshire, uh, and I wrote a paper called Emotional Intelligence where we proposed this idea. In light of the change in emotion literature, in light of the change of the intelligence literature, we argued maybe there's an emotional intelligence, and, and we tried to define it, uh, define it at the time as the ability to monitor your own and other people's feelings, discriminate among them, and most importantly, use this information to guide one's thinking and action. Now, there's a lesson, actually, in the story of this paper, because we submitted this paper to the very best journals in the field of psychology, and it got rejected by every one of them. Okay? We finally published it in a small journal that was edited by a colleague of mine, and um, uh, it has uh, gone on to be the most cited article that I've written in my, in my career so far. Okay? It's actually the most cited article that that journal has ever published. And I don't say that at all to brag about this article. I say it because there's a little bit of a lesson about frustration tolerance and in all of that. I mean, we really were about to give up. In fact, the way it got published in this little journal was we gave it to our colleague, Jerry Singer, and I said, Jerry, this thing keeps getting rejected, and it just doesn't get rejected. The reviewers hate this article. Can you help us figure out why? And you know, it was mostly, I wouldn't call it political, but it was offensive. To the people who studied intelligence, it was mixing up an already difficult concept with something even messier, emotion. To the people who studied emotions, they were generally not interested in individual differences. They were interested in general laws. And they didn't want, you know, don't turn emotion, the emotion field into the IQ field. You know, they didn't, weren't very interested in it. So everybody had reasons not to like it, and they were quite clear about it, and uh, uh, rejected, rejected this paper multiple times. But Jerry read it, gave us some feedback, and said, why don't you take my feedback uh, and uh, improve it, and then submit it to the journal I edit, and we'll see what happens. And, and he did publish it. Anyway, when this, when this uh, uh, paper came out, not too much happened. There wasn't a lot of interest. But in 1995, and I'll come back to this a little later, uh, Dan Goldman, who's a psychologist who really works as a journalist primarily, wrote a book, and the book was called Emotional Intelligence, and I'll talk later about how that happened. Uh, and uh, he quoted our definition of it and cited this paper. It um, was very nice to us in the book. But what, we, uh, what I didn't know is that book sold five million copies all over the world, and all of a sudden people got interested. And we started to take, in a way, our own idea more seriously. We realized this was, people were interested in this idea. So we needed better definitions, and maybe we needed a way to measure it. So we got to work. And so we wrote follow-up articles trying to define emotional intelligence more uh, precisely, arguing that it was four things, had to do with skills involved in perceiving and expressing emotion, skills involved in using emotion, particularly to engage in other uh, kinds of thinking, uh, understanding your emotions and putting them into language, and managing emotions in yourself and in other people. Okay? And we looked for ways that you could find evidence for these four aspects of emotional intelligence uh, in the world. So perceiving emotion might involve 
uh, understanding the emotion or, or, or identifying the emotion in yourself, in somebody else, in objects, in art, music, stories. That using emotion might involve how you generate emotions to psych yourself up to do something. Uh, how you use your emotions as a source of information to be creative. How, the role of emotions in solving a problem, uh, uh, in making a decision. Understanding might involve the relationship among emotions. Why is it when you embarrass someone, they're likely to get angry? Why is it that when somebody feels jealous, there's also a bit of envy in that jealousy situation? Uh, why is it that if somebody is irritated and you bother them, irritation might turn to rage? Okay, that's understanding emotion. And managing emotion, how is it that you can make yourself feel differently, uh, if you would like to? How is it that you can make somebody else feel differently? So I tell you that story about Bill Clinton at the beginning of my talk, in part to regulate your or manage your emotions. I want to put you in a good mood. I think that story has some interesting um, parts to it. And um, I'm hoping that I'll put you in a better mood to listen to my talk by telling you that story at the beginning. I'm managing your uh, emotions. All right. <clears throat> at about that time, uh, we, we were being fairly critical of the way in which people were trying, after the Goldman book came out, the way in which people were trying to measure emotion, their emotional intelligence. They were using all kinds of self-report tests, you know, basically with questions like, I understand my emotions. I think I'm a pretty sophisticated person when it comes to emotions, right? You answer true or false. If you answer a lot of them in the right direction, you get a high score. We, we thought this was not the way to measure emotional intelligence. We thought it'd be hard for people to know if they had these skills or not. You don't get a lot of feedback on these skills. Besides, if you were measuring Traditional intelligence, would you do it by asking people questions like, so, do you think you're pretty smart? And if people say yes, they get a high IQ, right? Probably not. So we got to work, actually, on trying to measure emotional intelligence as an ability and created a test we call the Mesquite, Mayor Salovey Crusoe Emotional Intelligence Test. And it's got two kinds of tasks for each of the four aspects or branches of emotional intelligence. So for perceiving emotion, we might show you faces and ask you what emotion is in this face. We might show you pieces of art and ask you what emotion was the artist trying to express in this picture. For using emotion, uh, we might do something that psychologists like to do called cross-modality matching, where you have to map the language of emotion into the language of another sense modality. Here we're asking what senses are like uh, being surprised. Uh, we might ask you to map emotions onto other kinds of tasks. So what mood would make it, might make it easier to ask somebody to help you? Okay. For understanding emotion, we might ask you vocabulary uh, items. Contempt most likely combines what emotions, maybe disgust and anger would be a good answer. Uh, for managing emotions, we might give you scenarios. This is hard to see, I apologize. But essentially, Debbie came back from a vacation. She's feeling peaceful and content. She'd like to continue to feel that way. What should she do? Well, she can start making a list of the things she needs to do, or she can begin to think about her next vacation, or she can ignore the feeling, or she could call a friend to describe her vacation. Some of those are better scenarios than others for continuing to feel good. Maybe calling the friend is a good one. Maybe planning the next vacation might not be bad. The other ones don't sound very effective. So the question is, how do you figure out what the right answers are uh, to questions like this? Well, we used actually a technique that the people who, uh, who uh, uh, invented some of the most popularly used IQ tests use. So when Wexler uh, um, invented the Wexler Adult Intelligence Test, or scales, um, some of the questions have objective right and wrong answers. So take these blocks, look at that picture, arrange these blocks in the same way as the picture. It's either right or wrong, and you can time on a stopwatch how long it takes somebody to do it. But these kind of questions are more like what Wexler called general information. So he had items like, um, 
What is the theme of the book of Genesis? Or uh, what would you do if you found a stamped letter that hadn't, wasn't canceled on the street? Well, so for the book of Genesis, you could say something like uh, the beginning of the world. That might get you two points. That's full credit. Or you might say something like uh, the trials and tribulations of humans. Eh, sort of. Maybe that gets you one point. Or you might say, uh, I don't know, a big flood. Uh, that might get you zero. Well, who decided that you get two, one, or zero? The letter question. Pick up the letter and put it in a mailbox gets you two points. Bring it home and give it to mom actually gets you one point. Uh, tear it up and throw it in a garbage can gets you zero point. Who decided that? So what Wexler did is he had experts. Now, he was a psychiatrist, so his experts were a group of psychiatrists. And they essentially went item by item, decided what was two points, what was one point, what was zero points, and that's what determines your IQ on those kinds of tests. So we did something similar, except we needed emotion experts. So who are emotion experts? So we tried in two different ways. First, in one way, we decided that Everyone's an expert. We just saw what were the consensual answers that 5,000 people gave us on these questions. But you might argue, I don't believe that. I don't believe that masses of humanity converge on the right answers. I want real experts. So we have real experts. The real experts are members of an organization called the International Society for Research on Emotion. These are philosophers, historians, and many psychologists who all spend their lives studying emotion. We said, based on your study, your understanding of emotion, what is the best answer to these questions? So we call that consensus scoring or expert scoring. Obviously, we want to move in, in subsequent tests to something even more objective than that. So, for example, we could take pictures of faces, morph them into other kinds of facial expressions, and ask, people to identify uh, when they see the emotion change. And then we can count the number of pixels that need to change uh, on the screen for you to notice the new expression. How sensitive are you to the new? That would be a more objective measure, and that's the direction we want to go. But in the meantime, we have, our, we have our experts. OK, let me tell you a little bit about the test. These are correlations. I think many of you have probably taken a statistics class. For those of you who haven't, these are just a measure of association. It's really almost all the statistics I'm going to show you are correlations. If two things are perfectly associated, they correlate at one. If two things are perfectly correlated but in opposite directions, they correlate at negative one. And if they're un unrelated, it's zero. So the distance of my left hand and right hand from the floor right now is correlated at one. But even if I start there and they move together, it's still correlated at one. Right now, they're correlated at negative one if I stop and take a measurement every time. right? As one gets higher, the other gets lower perfectly. And of course, this is much harder to do, but you can have a zero correlation where one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing. That's a zero correlation. Now, of course, for psychologists, correlations of 0 0.25, 0 0.30, 0 0.35, 0 0.40, 0 0.45, much more likely between something you measure in a human and then something you see in a human. And a 0 0.30 correlation is they're sort of associated. As one goes up, the other one sort of goes up, uh, but not perfectly, right? There's sort of a relationship between the two, but it's not perfect. If any of you were actually measuring that, you'll have to tell me whether that was 0 0.3 or not. So what you see here is a standard way psychologists make sure that their test is consistent, uh, uh, both in someone taking it and across time. And here you see, essentially, how your score correlates on the even-numbered items and on the odd-numbered items. You say 0 0.8, 0 0.9, it's very good, right? No matter what half of the test you take, you get the same emotional intelligence. Similarly, on the bottom, if you take the test and then take it again a month later, you get substantially the same score. The correlation is 0.86. And it doesn't, it actually, on this, it was equally reliable to use the consensus scoring, the mass scoring, or the experts. I still like experts better. In those early studies, we then said, all right, so you can make a good test, but does it actually predict anything? Does the score on that test actually matter in the world? And in the first studies, we looked at college students, gave them the mesquite, and we measured things about mostly uh, their lives. 
We asked them, we asked them to show us their dorm rooms. We asked them to tell us about their friends. We asked them in the last 30 days, had you used uh, an illicit drug or alcohol? In the last 30 days, had you gotten in a fight? And what we found is people who scored higher on emotional intelligence tests, had more pictures of their family in their room, uh, were less likely to report that they were having problems with their friends, were less likely to use drugs and alcohol, were less likely to get into fights, especially if they were men. Women didn't get into too many fights, so it's hard to show a relationship. This is a complicated slide, but the bottom line here is the following. Let's see if I can come over here. We measure emotional intelligence using the mesquite, those four branches. And then we ask people about all the kinds of things they might, be, might have done in the last uh, period of time. Drinking, smoking, using drugs, um, having uh, uh, sex with more than one partner, getting into fights, stealing, getting in conflicts with your parents. And what we find is that emotional intelligence predicts lower levels of all of these behaviors. They cluster into three groups and you get lower behavior, lower behavior. But what's most interesting is we also measured self-esteem. And once you look at people's emotional intelligence, self-esteem didn't matter. You could say everybody talks about these are the behaviors that people with low self-esteem engage in. But in fact, it didn't matter what their self-esteem is. If they were emotionally intelligent people, they were less likely to engage uh, in those kind of behaviors. In fact, sometimes it's high self-esteem people that engage in those behaviors because particularly if they're adolescents, I have high self-esteem, I feel invulnerable. I can do all of these things and I won't get caught, right? So it's not, self-esteem is not what it's cracked up uh, to be. We brought, we gave people the mesquite and then brought them into the laboratory and then had them interact with a stranger. And then we got the stranger to rate what that interaction was like. And then we got college students uh, to, rate, to, uh, to, to rate videotapes we took of those interactions. And what we found is, when someone scored high on the mesquite, even though no one knew their score, the stranger rated them as more likely to, as showing interest in them, and uh, as uh, seeking information from them, as listening to them. And the undergraduates who coded these video interactions rated them as more socially engaged, rated them as that person looks more like a team player, that person looks more competent. I'm gonna skip that one. But what about in the real world? Okay, I can make this kind of, I can show these relationships in the lab, but what about in the real world? Well, very early dissertation using our measure was done by Cheryl Rice, and she asked insurance adjusters to take the mesquite. Insurance adjusters are the people who come to your house when the tree has fallen on your car. And, they, uh, and, and the tree, your car is in the driveway, the tree is laying across the top of it. This actually happened to people in Connecticut in the last couple of months. And the adjuster looks at it and says, I'll give you $4,000. How satisfied were you with that number? What she found is when the adjusters had higher emotional intelligence, the customers were more satisfied, even though those adjusters didn't, didn't write bigger checks. Their checks were the same size as everybody else's. But what was it they must have done? They must have spent more time with the customer. They must have felt their pain. They must have um, 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 empathized with the tragedy that had uh, befallen their family. And uh, they, the customers were more satisfied. Uh, we asked, uh, uh, this was actually business school students, uh, working in groups on a problem solving test, we asked them uh, after 10 weeks to tell us who were the leaders in your group, okay? And people who scored high on the mesquite were more likely to be identified as the ones with strategic vision, as the ones who articulated new ideas, as the one who uh, recognized new opportunities, as the one who inspired everybody else. And we got that effect even if we measured their IQ, even if we measured their personality. So you can take all that out statistically and, and the mesquite, emotional intelligence, still matters. Okay, the last uh, study that I'll show you in any detail. I'll mention a couple of others later. Uh, we actually went into a health insurance company in Connecticut, and we measured uh, everybody in their finance division's emotional intelligence. That group was relatively small. There's only 44 people in this study. It's really too small. It's too small. But we had great data, because a year later, 
We had the salary recommendations that their supervisors had made for each of these employees. And we had their performance evaluations that their supervisors had written. And what did we find? Well, first of all, we had, we had their peers and their supervisors' ratings of them. The ones who scored higher on the mesquite were rated by peers and supervisors as more sensitive, more sociable, by supervisors as, as more likable, by both as contributing to a positive work environment, uh, by supervisors as more stress tolerant, by both as having more leadership potential. Again, these correlations got to be careful. It's a small sample, so there's a lot of noise around them, big confidence interval around them. But they're all suggestive. They're essentially all in the right direction, every one of them. Then we looked a year later. We went back to the company and we'd said, uh, hide everybody's names, but show us their salaries. And show us how big a raise they got. And what you see, look at Mesquite Total, the green area there. And you see how big a raise they got was correlated with their Mesquite scores from a year earlier. Uh, was it was correlated with their rank in the company. Um, uh, almost everything in this chart is positive on all four branches. It's only one negative number in this matrix. And if you look at managing emotion in particular, that seemed to be maybe most important. Understanding looks like it matters a lot too. But essentially, the people who understand their emotions and manage them, they end up being better compensated uh, in this company. Again, we need to replicate this study because the sample is kind of small, but uh, very suggestive that this matters in the world of work. Okay, that's it for studies. Let me just tell you what we're doing right now, and then I'll reflect on a little bit on where this is all going. First of all, can you learn it? Can you learn to be more emotionally intelligent? Well, we have studies now where we have developed a, an elementary school curriculum and a middle school curriculum. We're teaching them in the classroom. We train the teachers to actually deliver this curriculum. And uh, what we're finding is that it does affect kids' behavior in the classroom and their academic performance. So uh, this is a cur curriculum called Emotional Literacy. Mark Brackett, who's a postdoc in my lab, developed it with his uncle, Marvin Maurer, who's a school teacher and a jazz musician. And uh, we, are, we have done studies now on Long Island, in upstate New York, in Kent, England. But my favorite study is one we're finishing up right now. We, are, we randomized every classroom in uh, 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 middle school grades, in the parochial schools, the Catholic schools of Brooklyn and Queens, New York. And they either get our program or some other program. And then we can look over a couple year period at whether uh, uh, these programs matter. And we're finding that they do. These are from a pilot study, a smaller study than the parochial school one. But what you see are correlations. As kids do better on the Mesquite youth version, their teachers rate them as having more social skills, more leadership skills, <laughs> less anxiety, less conduct problems, less learning problems. Even if you control for whether they're boys or girls, whether they come from a rich, middle class, or poor family, even if you control for what their IQ is, you still see those uh, effects. Um, over time, it looks like that their grades uh, go up uh, as well. This is important because the politics of these school-based programs are such that if you can't show an effect on academic outcomes, it's very hard to convince a school board uh, to, to uh, 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 allow the kids to engage in one of these curricula, take, basically take time out of the school day uh, to do it. We also looked at investors. So we, uh, a large mutual fund company that uh, may in fact be involved in investing the pensions of professors here at Quinnipiac, it is involved at Yale. Uh, we got a, a, a very large group of customers whose names and identifying information were hidden from us, but we were able to measure their mesquite scores, their emotional intelligence. And what we found is the ones with lower managing emotion scores were uh, more likely to trade, trade investments in their portfolio. Uh, what they were more likely to be doing, we think, is reacting to news, getting anxious, getting fearful and thinking they needed to do something, when usually sitting tight, not doing anything, is the best uh, strategy. How many of you have taken a psych intro psych or social psych uh, class? Okay, maybe you heard about uh, affective forecasting. This is the ability to predict your future emotions. So 
We have an election tomorrow. If my candidate wins, how good will I feel? If my candidate loses, how bad will I feel? I'm getting my midterm back next tomorrow. If I do better than expected, how good will I feel? If I, wor if I do worse than ex expected, how badly will I feel? We're actually not very good at this. We think we're going to feel better or worse than we actually do. We feel good if we win. We feel bad if we lose. But, but it's not nearly as extreme as we predict. So Dan Gilbert up at Harvard, Tim Wilson at Virginia have done these studies showing again and again we are very bad forecasters of our emotions. We, over -re we think we're going to overreact. And what we showed is that's true. But in people with high emotional intelligence, they don't show the bias nearly as strongly. And this is, uh, I won't go through the slide, but essentially, the bias you show in predicting your feelings after an election or after getting a midterm back is similar, and the size of that bias is smallest for highly emotionally intelligent uh, people. Finally, I'll show you a little biology here, since this is interdisciplinary uh, 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 research um, um, program that we're, uh, uh, I'm presenting in today. Uh, I'm not a brain scientist, but, uh, but I work with one in the psychology department at Yale named Jeremy Gray. And he gave a social problem solving test to a small group of subjects who then had their brains scanned with fMRI while they solved this social problem. And he looked at activity in an area of the brain called the frontal pole, which is involved in solving these social problems. It's involved in planning, integration, cooperation. And he measured how much activity would you find, do you see in that, in that pole, in that frontal pole? And what you see here is the emotional intelligence scores on the mesquite plotted on the x-axis and the amount of activity on the y-axis. And he takes out all, a lot of the noise in these kind of data and shows a fairly um, um, monotonic function where the more emotional intelligence you have, the less activity. Well, why would that be? I don't really know for sure, but one way to interpret that data is to the extent you have more emotional intelligence, your brain doesn't have to work as hard to solve the social problem. And you can actually pick that up in fMRI. If you don't have much emotional intelligence, your brain is up here. You're this guy up here. Your brain is cranking away trying to solve the problem. It's lighting up in the fMRI in, in, in that uh, uh, BA10 area. As you try to solve the problem, you're not solving it. It just keeps working at it, OK? It's like a car with the clutch pedal pressed, right? It's, you know, you can rev up that engine, but it isn't going anywhere. And that's what th those people may be like on that end. That was rank speculation. We should recognize it as such. Uh, but uh, um, very suggestive data in, in my mind. Finally, we're working on measurement and asking the question that I started with. Why is it that when you measure emotional intelligence using scales like the mesquite, you get different answers than when you just ask people about their emotional intelligence? In fact, the two don't correlate. People who think they're high may or may not be high. People who think they're low may or may not be low. And I think part of the problem is actually the self-report measures are not really measuring emotional intelligence. Turns out they're measuring other things. They're measuring personality. They're measuring how happy you are, your well-being. And those are important things, and they're good to measure. And you can measure them through self-report. But I think they're not really measuring emotional intelligence. That's what we're finding. OK, five minutes uh, uh, on the context in which all of this happens, all this work happens, and then we'll finish up. Why is it that you might have heard about emotional intelligence before today? Maybe you studied it. Maybe you saw some of our work. But it's more likely that you saw this book. As I said, this book was written by Dan Goldman. It was written when you were, many of you were small children. But it, um, it sold 5 million copies. It was translated into something like 25 languages. There was a period of time where no matter where I traveled in the world, I promise you I could go into an airport bookstore and find this book displayed prominently on the shelf. And what did this book, this book was called Emotional Intelligence, Why It Can Matter More Than IQ, Redefining What It Means to Be Smart. And this book was a huge hit. 
I don't complain about this book because it did talk about our work and all of a sudden people started caring about our work. But of course, it was written for the general public by someone writing really in a journalistic style. So it wasn't especially cautious. He was right about many things. He, he anticipated some of the brain, the neuroscience research, uh, uh, particularly the work of Joe Ledoux, if you know that work, quite well but when it was just starting out. Um, but of course, he are, you know, the cover itself argues why it can matter more than IQ when in 1995 we didn't even have a way to measure it. Okay? So it was really out there, but it, boy, it put the idea on everyone's lips and it got picked up by the media. And there's an interesting story here, a new idea. Why does it catch fire? Time Magazine does a cover story on what's your EQ. Not a bad cover story. It's not your IQ. It's not a number. But it might be the best predictor of success in life, redefining what it means to be smart. Maybe. Of course, there weren't any measures yet, so maybe not. I noticed when I showed this slide that apparently I stole this copy of Time Magazine from the lounge at the law school <laughs> of Quinnipiac College. I just want you to see. I don't know how that happened, actually. but. Actually, I think I do. At the time, uh, any of you know Neil Feigenson, professor in the law school? Uh, Neil and I were collaborating on some research, and he was visiting the lab a lot, and I think he gave me the Time magazine. Anyway, after time, it goes all over the world. It's in, there's a story about, uh, oh, you can't see it. Up on the very top, there's a banner that says, what's your IQ, what's your EQ? Okay. It's also stories about the Deutschmark and stories about O.J. Simpson. Uh, magazine in uh, Spain, Muy Interesante, what, uh, about emotional intelligence in Japan, about emotion, the emotionally intelligent salesperson. Does anybody read Japanese in this room? I, I don't either, but I think it says the emotionally intelligent salesperson, and he's designed to look like Clark Kent, and he's revealing his secret weapon. That underneath, he's Mr. EQ. What this does, oh, I should say, all of this work was extremely positive, and, not, and un, I would call it uncritical. And you could say, well, what's wrong with that, right? Well, there's actually a certain amount wrong with that. It creates the expectation that emotional intelligence is the silver bullet, is the magic potion. Just drink it, and you're going to be fine. Well, you know, I believe in emotional intelligence, but I don't think we should exa have exaggerated claims for it. The only press I was ever able to find that was at all cynical was in France. And uh, this is a uh, very cynical article that says something like, a re in sarcastic terms, a revelation from the United States. Uh, two researchers, Peter Salve and Jack Mayer, have this idea of emotional intelligence. And then it goes on to say, but who are these Americans to tell the French about emotions? We are the people of emotion. And they go on to make fun of the idea and to say it's obvious to any good French person that emotional intelligence uh, uh, it ma matters, but you know, but you don't need an American to tell you this. So, um, uh, but you know what's interesting is that was really, I mean, it's, all, it's a funny article rather than a negative article, but there was really no negative press. So what happened is all of a sudden commercialization, major commercialization. Now, does that bother me? Not really. It's okay. People have a right to make a living, and we started to see programs for organizational development and pol political consulting. A uh, guy at Princeton wrote a book analyzing the emotional intelligence of every president of the United States since, um, uh, since Franklin Roosevelt. Emotion-based marketing became uh, uh, an interest in, on, on uh, Madison Avenue. Personal growth programs in Australia developed. There's a guy in Australia call, used to call me about every six months saying, uh, Peter, you want to go in the outback and eat snike with me and talk about our feelings? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Not really, um, but they, you know, and, uh, and educational curricula all over the world. So companies um, uh, like EQ Japan grew up. I actually, um, in full disclosure, have done consulting work for EQ Japan. Companies like China New Leaders, I've given talk for China New Leaders, all interested in capturing this idea of emotional intelligence. All of that is fine. But you know, when people are claiming it's the next magic bullet, What's going to happen? There's going to be a backlash. And there was. And so I think we are now through the backlash. But for about five years, 
Um, there was uh, many articles published, especially in the uh, human resources and organizational development literature. Uh, people like Ed Locke, Frank Landy, writing, what is this? There's no science here. Well, there was science here, but the claims were far outstripping the science. And so we went through this period of push and pull, promoting the idea, but recognizing that it had limitations, and recognizing that um, uh, probably the applications were way out ahead of the science, but that's always the case. That's always the case. Personally, I think we should embrace it and look at these applications as opportunities for research. But of course, at the same time, distance ourselves a little bit from the most extreme claims. Well, that sounded like a downer, but it also had some positive implications. It brought me closer to my mother. Why? What's my mom got to do with all this? Well, my mother was always deeply disappointed that I didn't become a physician. I grew up, and it's sort of traditional, middle class, New York, Jewish family. What are you supposed to be? You're supposed to be a doctor. And why are you supposed to be a doctor? Because it's a reliable source of income, primarily, I think. And you're helping people. And when I said I was going to study psychology instead of pre-med uh, when I was an undergraduate at Stanford, it was a disappointment to my mother. But she said, I hear that medical schools still accept Psych majors. I said, yeah, but I'm not going to medical school. I'm going to go become a clinical psychologist. And uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to go to Yale. And my mother said, hmm, clinical psychology. You could still have an office, right? Yeah. Hang out a shingle. Yeah. Still treat patients, right? Yeah. Collect insurance reimbursement. Yeah. Well, that's good. Well, except I'm not going to be that kind of psychologist. I'm going to do research in a lab, and I'm going to teach. Oh, more disappointment. Mom, I became a professor at Yale. Well, OK, but you're not a doctor. I became dean. Well, yeah, that's OK, but you're not a doctor. And well, finally, what I was doing with my life mattered to my mother when she saw it in a cartoon in The New Yorker. My mother reads The New Yorkers, and you can't see this very well, so I'll read it to you. But this was a cartoon in The New Yorker. My mother said, I finally appreciate uh, uh, what you're doing with your life because Roz Chess, the great New Yorker cartoonist, is talking about your work. So here is a husband and wife. They're eating breakfast and uh, drinking coffee, and the television newscaster is on. And she says to him, Jesus, did you hear that? And he says, no, what? She says, that newscaster just said, irregardless. <laughs> Doesn't that bother you? No. Why should it? She says, well, I happen to no think that newscasters should know the correct word. That's all, right? Irregardless is not a word. Uh, he says, what's it supposed to be? Disregardless? So you know, she's getting all emotionally worked up, and he's not managing her emotion very well, right? Not showing emotional intelligence. All I'm saying, she says, is that people who say irregardless are total cretins. A cretin was like a, like a word for idiot, really, out of the 50s. Uh, and he says, lots of people say irregardless. She says, that's exactly my point. Lots of people are cretins. He says, look, just because a person doesn't have book smarts doesn't mean he or she is stupid. That newscaster might have a lot of emotional intelligence. So she says, may I interject a teensy-weensy thought and here's her teensy weensy thought. She says, blowing her stack, she says, emotional intelligence is crap. So my mother calls me up and says, all right, so you're not a doctor. I've gotten over it because Roz Chest did a cartoon on emotional intelligence. But I've written Roz Chest a letter. And I've told her I'd like the last panel of that cartoon, the gel, it's called the gel, so that you can frame it and hang it in your office. This is it. And remind yourself to stay humble and to have humility. And that you always will have the pride of your mother on the one hand, but you will also be deeply disappointed that you didn't become a doctor. Anyway, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you.
if you are interested, these are a couple of websites where you can download our papers and everything I talked about pretty much is in a paper on that website. Great, thank you. Oops. Can I just remind uh, everyone that uh, is exiting, a number, number of students are probably going off to class. If you could exit quietly, um, you open for a few questions? Sure. Um, and then stay around for the poster session or go to your class and come back for the poster session. There's students who would love to see you there. Thanks. So those of you who can stay, I'm happy to take a couple of questions. Yes? Yep. Yeah. So the question is about autistic people, uh, that they have a hard time recognizing facial expressions and can maybe there's new programs using computers to teach them recognition. I actually do think these are what some of the deficits are in autism. I'm not saying this is what autism is, uh, but it is part of it. Uh, one of the big deficits in autism is knowing what to pay attention to. So it's not even just that they don't recognize facial expressions, they don't recognize, they don't realize that the face is where the information is in the interaction. So they're staring off at the fire alarm because that's kind of interesting and missing uh, 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 the face. There is some evidence, and some of it is at the Yale Child Study Center with programs that Fred Volkmar and Ami Klim have been involved in, uh, where you can actually teach uh, people with autism, particularly if it's on the milder side, uh, to, uh, to unlearn that behavior and to learn new behaviors. To actually learn, stare at the person's face, You'll learn, you know, and, and then what to look for in the face. So this is, I, I think, a promising, uh, promising uh, kind of research. Yes? Yeah, so are there correlations between age and emotional intelligence? And the answer is yes. This is great news for those of you who are my age. Um, unlike IQ, which rises uh, uh, through the teenage years and then kind of tops out at, in late adolescence, and the IQ you have at age 20 is basically your IQ for your life, we see emotional intelligence rising through the 30s, through the 40s, and topping out in middle age middle, middle age, late 40s, and then staying there uh, uh, for, we, we don't have extremely old population, but staying there at that level for the rest of your life. So it may work less like intelligence, traditionally defined, and more like wisdom. Through experience, you gain, you gain emotional intelligence. <laughs> Yeah, so what, so what she's saying, you have different kinds of experiences, you can develop emotional intelligence, and we think that's true. We don't have good data to show that yet, but we do believe that, for example, people who get into the arts, people who listen to music, people who read a lot, pe these are people who are interested in relationships with people, people who raise a family, all of those are ways to develop these skills. You know, I can promise you uh, uh, that interacting with your children, with one's children, uh, is going to require some of these skills, and you can you can learn them uh, uh, that way. Yes. So that would make that would lead one to think about gender differences, and in fact, there is a fairly consistent gender difference in all of this. Um, who, who do you think does better? Women. That is true. But it's not a huge effect. It's about a quarter to a half of a standard deviation, but we see it in virtually every study we do. Very consistent effect, very consistent, small, but stable effect. Women do do better. And I think it's, I mean, I, you know, there's lots of reasons why people might think that's the case. I think it's life experience. I think women are engaged in more interactions where emotional skills matter and they're reinforced for it more systematically than, than men, right? Boys are taught not to cry, not to, you know, to shut off their emotions. Women aren't. Yes? This raises the question, though, of what defines success, success and how this hold, how the concept of emotional intelligence holds up across culture. 
Yeah, so what defines success, of course, is very difficult to define, and it's going to be different in different cultures. Um, you know, we tend to look at, you know, satisfaction with relationships, satisfaction, so we, it's, all, it's very subjective what we, we tend to use. Um, what about cultures, though? So I think the missing part in all of this is the fact that we're not paying much attention to culture, and I think if there's a fifth branch of emotional intelligence, it might be sensitivity to cultural differences, especially in emotional expression. So let me give you an example. When I used to go to Japan a lot uh, to work with this company, EQ Japan, um, I would often have an interaction that would go something like the following. Peter, and they'd say, Salve-san, where would you like to go to dinner tonight? We can go to the sushi restaurant, or we can go to the new Italian restaurant in our neighborhood. And I would say, well, I'm in Japan. Let's go eat sushi. I, I, I didn't get into it. You know, I'm in New Haven. It's the best Italian food outside of Italy, you know. But we're in Japan. Let's have sushi. Evening would come. I'd be driven to the restaurant. And it'd be the Italian restaurant. We'd sit down and eat. And I'd think to myself, how did that just happen? <laughs> he asked me, well, as a Westerner, we generally assume that a question involving uh, a, pre a stated preference is a chance to show autonomy and state of preference, right? Which do you like better? That's actually not the nature of that question in Japan. In Japan, that's a, uh, I missed the point of the question. The point of the question is an opportunity to show some deference and appreciation for my host and to maximize harmony for the group. So I'm not supposed to express a preference. I'm supposed to turn it around and say to my host, gee, sushi or Italian food, which would you like to do? Or you live in Tokyo, which, would be, which do you think is better? It's, an, it's a, soliciting a different, it's a different kind of question than the one I thought it's being asked. Now, I actually think emotion is involved in that because it has something to do with empathizing with the person asking the question, recognizing op when opportunities to show harmony and appreciation differ from opportunities to um, show, um, assert, assert individuality uh, and, and preferences. Um, we try not to put questions on the mesquite that, sh that have cultural biases in them, but you easily could. What about a question like, what is the proper emotion to display at a funeral? Well, let's just stay here in North America. Here in, uh, in Connecticut, what would be the proper emotion? Well, Mark Twain said Connecticut Yankees are uh, practical, yes, but devoid of passion or poetry. Well, that's not very fair, but let's pretend we're at the funeral of Connecticut Yankee and if you asked what's the appropriate emotion, you can be sad, but you should be dignified about it, right? So to look kind of calm and dignified. What if you're at a funeral of um, Eastern or Southern European, Greek, Jewish, um, uh, Italian, uh, uh, Pole, Russian? Well, they'd say sad, but you can show it a little bit more. You can cry more openly. You can hug each other. Uh, at the end of it, we're probably going to eat more than the Connecticut Yankees, uh, too. That's my culture. Um, what, I was once in New Orleans and watching an African-American family in New Orleans um, celebrate a funeral. And they were dancing and playing music and having a parade down the street. And they were celebrating their friend who was going to a better place. Okay? So, yeah, you can be sad, but you show joy. He's going to the next world, and I'm going to see him there someday. I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in, right? And so um, uh, a question like that really gets at cultural differences in emotional expression. Uh, and uh, I think we have uh, ignored it, uh, or at least uh, not emphasized it. And I think that's the next direction that I want to, I want to take with this. So I think, what, yeah, what are the classroom implications? I think one of the things, at least in the classrooms we're in, which are not college classrooms, they're elementary middle, middle school students, we use, we teach teachers to use the um, language arts classes as an opportunity to just help students learn an emotion vocabulary, reflect on their emotions, uh, uh, and uh, by primarily um, uh, thinking about the emotions about in characters they're reading, learning uh, words, et cetera. Um, but I actually think, in general, um, 
you know, we're, we've done some work where we're interested in bullying, we're interested in positive relationships, and we're interested in, in students' um, enjoyment of the classroom, of school. And it turns out that this, this kind of thing matters. And uh, if you want, invite Mark Brackett, my um, uh, collaborator, uh, to talk about um, uh, some of what he's finding in these schools because he's got great video of kids you know, I used to come into school and be angry at my parents for sending me and, you know, anxious about school and so I'd pick on the other kids and then I learned to, you know, to talk about those feelings that we have this one kid who says, and now I'm writing poems, you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of funny. But, um, uh, you know, I think, I think actually, you know, one of the first students like this. And I think one of, the, one of the aspects in the classroom that really matters is they enjoy, they enjoy it. They enjoy coming to classes and talking about their feelings. Uh, more than we would, right? But these middle school kids really do. And it changes, it changes what they do in the classroom. Yes? Excuse me, let me say, you said earlier that as people, uh, emotional intelligence is something that you can build over time. Yeah. And I'm wondering what information you have to uh, support that, in that when people move from one culture to the next, are they you know, they have new experiences when they're older. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's probably true. So what you know, in, in general emotional intelligence levels off in middle age. But what about people who's who have major life changes? New families, new cultures, new jobs and roles in life. You know, I, I you know, I would bet that those still um, enhance these skills. Yeah, I, I meant um, a woman who was 67 years old, who learned to read uh, when she was, you know, 65 years old, and she learned to read for the first time. Mm -hmm. And she told me that not only did the whole world open up to her, but that she was discovering herself. And she had all of these wonderful things to tell me that she learned. And I just thought she completely changed, that she became. So I love this story. You know, this is a, an adult learning to read for the first time and, and feeling like it changed her as a person. When we do these programs in elementary and middle school, we argue that it's through reading books uh, that students learn about emotions, mostly by identifying with characters. Uh, and that's why we teach it in language arts courses. I, I, think, uh, I think it is one of the great vehicles. Do you notice in your work with middle school students that there's any correlation between improved academic performance? Yeah, so what we're showing in, in this parochial school study in Brooklyn and Queens, it's got it with thousands of students and hundreds of teachers and classrooms and, and scores of schools, we're seeing the following relationship. The students who get the emotional intelligence curriculum, their behaviors in school change. Uh, in the ways that the teachers were rating it in, our, in the little study I showed you. And, and, and their, emotion, their emotional intelligence changes on our measures. And then that change predicts academic outcomes too. They do better in school. Their grades go up. Their attendance goes up. So um, we're, we're analyzing those data now. Those are just preliminary findings. We're going to write that up. But we are really excited about these findings. We're also really excited because it was a, a real experiment with randomization. So, you know, half, we have a control group that we can compare it to, and it doesn't happen in the control group. So uh, we're really, yeah, it's a really nice outcome. And, uh, uh, you know, we weren't sure it was going to work when we went into this, but it looks very promising. I hate to be oh. Oh, uh, so maybe we'll take the, the last one and, uh, yeah. Dr. Uh, Sell, okay, yes. We'll take the last one, yeah. Well, you, uh, when you mentioned about uh, self-esteem, yeah. um, not, not being a big factor, you know. In those outcomes, yeah. Yes. Um, so in, in, in these schools then, where at least some schools, self-esteem is a big item. Yeah. And are you anywhere where self-esteem was a major factor and maybe they not dismissed it, but maybe back off a bit and rely more on the uh, EQ uh, work I, I and, hope, and, and how, yeah. how the results are showing there. Yeah. I, mean. I hope that's happening because the data on self-esteem, uh, despite that whole California self-esteem movement and all of that, the data on self-esteem as, as mattering in terms of um, students' behavior in the classroom and academic, it's not very strong. And as I said, it, particularly for adolescents, some of the mo riskiest behaviors, some of the most obnoxious behaviors 
are high self-esteem kids because they feel invulnerable, nothing can hurt them, I can, I can do all kinds of horrible things and it's not gonna matter. Um, uh, I think it's a real, it was a real mistake and it wasn't based on research, it was based on something that sounded good and it caught on. I mean, it does sound good, Gee, you know, the problem is you need to have higher self-esteem and you won't, yeah, and you'll do better in school and, and it just turned out not to, be, not to be true. I think one of the big disconnects in this world is, and I see it, you know, uh, uh, whether in the business world or in education, is how little of what we do is driven by, by research findings. It's driven by ideas that catch on, and those ideas may catch on for all kinds of reasons. They may catch on because there is research backing to them. They may catch on because somebody was a good salesperson. They may catch on because it seems intuitively appealing. It may catch on because we're grasping at straws. Uh, but, um, you know, it's hard for a researcher to actually notice that in the adoption of new practices, research is not playing that strong a role. I, w I wish it were different. And so, you know, giving talks to general audiences is partly one of the things one can do. Writing books for general audiences that still appeal to the research base is one of the things to try to do. Uh, one tries to do. But um, it, it's a disappointment, actually, how, how much we do in the world where there is research you could rely on, but people don't rely on it. Yeah. Thank you very much. You've all been very patient. Great questions. <laughs>